Hi, I'm Michael Davey, owner of Michael Davey Theatrical Cosmetics. Watermelon is a latex alternative I developed back in 2000 as a plastic cap material. The great thing about watermelon was that the caps I made with it could be applied with alcohol instead of adhesive. Since then, I started developing appliances that could be applied the same way. Anything you can do with latex, you can do with watermelon. You can slush it, gel it, stipple it, dip it, and foam it. And today, I'll be demonstrating how to foam watermelon. A prior experience with foam latex will be helpful, but not essential. Some of the techniques in this tutorial will cross over to foam latex, and those with a foam latex background can relate to these references. But even the novice should find this tutorial enlightening as to a new way to utilize watermelon in a closed mold. Foaming watermelon requires the use of a closed mold. This is a mold with a front and a back as opposed to an open face plate mold used for slushing. I'll cover slushing in an open plate mold in a later video. The mold we are using today belongs to a friend of mine, Dan Bedell, and we are making an appliance for his character, Percy. The first step is to release the entire mold with release agent. The release agent we're using is a tincture of castor oil, which is castor oil reduced with either ethyl or isopropyl alcohol. This is the same release we use when doing foam latex. We apply the castor oil liberally to both halves of the mold, including the overflow. When the mold closes, the foam will flow out of the mold, and we need to be sure that the foam releases from the outside of the mold during removal. Once the castor oil is applied, we powder the castor oil, which helps the foam flow into all the detail. Then, once we have released the positive half of the mold, we release the negative half in the same way. Using a chip brush, we apply the release into all the detail, including the eyes and outside of the mold, anywhere the watermelon foam may touch it. On a side note, one advantage to using watermelon foam as opposed to latex foam in an appliance mold is that it contains no sulfur, which would contaminate the mold, for any future silicone use. This mold is quite old and has been used repeatedly for over 20 years to make gelatin appliances, foam latex, and most recently foam watermelon. It has certainly seen better days, but it's still suitable for watermelon. The components we use to make foam watermelon are watermelon soft, you can also use watermelon regular, Dr. Bronner's pure castile soap, and some have used foam latex foaming agent. We're using the lavender scent and I don't recommend the eucalyptus scent. And foam latex gelling agent, which is sodium silico fluoride. Be sure to wash your hands when finished using sodium silico fluoride. We're using Monster Maker's brand, but any brand will do. Also, you will need to refrigerate the sodium silico fluoride before use. Being a salt, the colder temperature keeps it from going into solution too fast, allowing it to be dispersed easier into the watermelon foam. In addition to the chemical components, you will also need a narrow container to mix the watermelon in. This one is polycarbonate, but any material should do, as long as it won't break during whipping. The narrow walled beaker helps concentrate the whipping action of the beater, just like a blender does. Too wide of a mixing container may increase the whipping time greatly. We're also using a wire whisk attachment. Next, we need to pre-measure these components into a separate container. 150 grams of watermelon soft, 5 ounces.
then 15 grams of the Dr. Bronner's soap. Then, five grams of purified water. And finally, 15 to 18 grams of the cold gelling agent. Now add the watermelon to the whipping container. Then add the Dr. Bronner soap. Stir the two components together and as you do this, you will notice the watermelons start to thicken. Then add five grams of purified water the water will allow the soap to foam easier. Once you've added the water, you can begin to whip. In general, the longer you whip, the higher the volume of foam will be. The exact time for your purposes will come with experience, but you will be able to eyeball how high you want the foam to rise. Don't be in a hurry. Unlike foam latex, there is no ammonia to whip off, so the length of time whipping is only guided by how fluffy you want the foam. For our whipping, we're using a drill with a single mixer whisk blade. In our setup, an extra mysterious hand can be helpful to hold the container. For lack of an extra hand, I've previously placed the container on the floor between my shoes and held it there myself while whipping. As I whip, I move the blade around the container in an orbital fashion rotating clockwise and counterclockwise to incorporate air into the mixture. While whipping, I can mention that you should keep records of your mixing experiences noting the results. You can also make a volume stick appropriate for your container to measure the height of the beginning liquid and marking 1x, 2x, 3 times volume so that you can record the mixing times and heights of the foam. This may be helpful for any future work as reference, but frankly foam watermelon is not as much rocket science as foam latex is. As the foam rises in the container, you will begin to notice the height on the mixer blade. As the foam rises, the blade will begin to become covered by the foam. As it does, you will notice the whipping action become more effective. Continue the orbital motion of the blade in the container as the foam rises. This will also ensure that material on the sides of the container become incorporated into the whip. Occasionally, scraping of the sides can be helpful, but stop whipping as you do this for safety reasons.
Once the material thickens enough, you may be able to carefully release the container to allow it to spin on its own a bit. Monitor this carefully so that it does not fly out of control, but allowing it to spin incorporates air and helps it froth. The material will creep up the sides of the container, and when it does, grab the container and allow it to stop spinning. You can also control the spinning with the depth of the whisk attachment. You will notice that the blade is disappearing beneath the foam. This indicates the material rising. You will also be able to feel the resistance on the drill as the foam thickens. Again, the exact mixing times are not quantified and you can determine this for yourself. In our narrow walled container, we have found that a refining stage, as with foam latex, is not as necessary with foam watermelon. We can refine during the stage when we add the cold gelling agent. Next, we add the cold gelling agent. This has been pre-measured to 15 to 18 grams. Add this slowly to the foam so that the pH does not drop too quickly. Thoroughly mix this into the foam, ensuring that it's completely mixed. Also, during this stage, you can refine the foam, making sure the cells are all a uniform size. We are using the Monster Makers brand of gelling agent, and different brands may yield different gelling results. The refrigeration of the gelling agent allows us time to be sure it's completely dispersed into the foam before it lowers the pH and gels the watermelon. This is the same mechanism that gels foam latex. Don't be in a rush and be sure that the foam is thoroughly mixed. A final refining ensures a uniform cell size. Once you're satisfied with the mixture, slowly raise the wire whisk blade from the foam, making sure not to incorporate any more large bubbles into the mix. At this point, you note the peaks of the foam and how well it holds its consistency. Now you should immediately fill your negative mold with the foam. The clock is now ticking and it's only a matter of time before the foam gels, but don't panic. Make sure you get the foam into all the detail of the mold without trapping any air bubbles. Gently press the foam into the detail, spreading it over the entire negative mold as you go. You want to overfill the mold so that the pressure during closing will force the foam into any crevices and squeeze any excess out of the mold. Once you feel the mold is loaded, place the positive face side into, into the negative and press firmly. As you do, the excess should squeeze out of the mold until it's completely closed. If you have a well-constructed mold, you can stand on it as shown in the foaming gelatin video, but this mold is too old and fragile for that. Just press firmly and wait for the foam to gel. At this point, you can notice how similar it resembles foam latex in both consistency and behavior. You can also notice when monitoring for gelation the sparkle associated with foam latex gelation.
You can also notice the flow of the material as it drips before it gels. Notice the gel in the same way as you notice with foam latex. It loses its shine, and when pressed in a test pile, it stays indented. Gel gelation should occur within 10 to 15 minutes of adding the gelling agent. Finally, press the overflow, and if it's gelled, the chances are that the material inside the mold is gelled too. Once it is gelled, you can move the mold to the oven to bake just like foam latex. I recommend baking at about 110 Fahrenheit for at least four hours, maybe even overnight to avoid steam. We use a simple dehydrator for this, and times depend on your mold size. Once the mold has cooled, it's ready to open. Testing the flashing is a start, but it does not give you an accurate idea of whether the appliance is dry, so you will need to open it carefully to avoid possibly tearing it. As with latex, there is a high water content, hence the name, so stone molds work best. Also, as with latex, you can use resin molds, but you will need to adjust your baking accordingly. The first step in opening is to release the flashing. You will notice that the flashing will tend to stick more to one half of the mold than the other. Ideally, you want the appliance to remain in the negative half and remove the positive mold, but I've had times where the appliance comes clean out of the negative, still stuck to the positive, so you need to be ready for this possibility too. I use a wooden popsicle stick to help free the piece from the mold. Tilting the mold on end helps to distribute the weight of each half on itself so that one half isn't sitting on top of the other. This helps when prying them apart. You want to get the mold just barely separated so that you can see whether the appliance will want to stick to the positive or negative mold. The stick will help you slowly guide the appliance from one side or the other. In this case, we've removed the flashing from the positive half. Now, we are loosening the flashing from the negative to get in for a bit of a pry point. The mold has started opening, but we don't want to just yank it and destroy any thin edges, so we're going slowly around the entire edge to make sure the mold half is free all the way around. And again, just like latex, we powder as we go so that the material doesn't stick to itself. If the cutting edge on the mold has done its job, the edge should be thin and the flashing will want to fall off the rest of the appliance. With the flashing out of the way, we can easily see the rest of the appliance in the mold and continue opening the mold all the way. Usually the deepest areas are the hardest to free up. This is where the stick really comes in handy. Before the two halves are completely open, we need to free up the nose area with the stick to avoid tearing it. Once it is open, powder the back of the appliance liberally. For an old 20 plus year old mold, it performed beautifully. It's at this point that if the appliance is not fully dry, you can return it to the oven for further drying. But this one looks good. There don't seem to be any large voids or bubbles and no steam lakes, so it's a keeper. The next step is to remove it from the negative side. Where you begin is arbitrary, but I usually like to start at the highest point and let gravity work to my advantage. Again, you want to work slowly so you don't tear any thin edges. Try and free up all the way around as you work your way towards the center of the appliance. Work evenly so that one area doesn't pull on another area and powder as you go.
Try and get to a thick area with your finger and roll it back out towards the edge from the inside out. Sometimes when you reach an impasse, it's easier to come at it from the other side of the impasse. This happens a lot around the eye and nose area. Folding the appliance onto itself helps to keep the free areas out of your way as you work on different areas. Once the appliance is clear, lay it on the positive as a cradle and inspect for any defects. This one looks pretty good. Powder one final time. This one has nice thin blending edges and hardly any bubbles. All of the detail come out and it's ready for the application in an upcoming video, which will feature application with alcohol and blending edges with alcohol. Thank you for your interest in foaming watermelon. For more information, please contact us at www.michaeldavy.com or dial 1-888-225-7026.